Yeah, it's a flame of knowledge. Knowledge. Like the three squares stand for something, but I can't remember. <laughs> okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Victoria Sinclair, from the University of Helsinki, who's going to talk about exotropical cyclones in the future. Okay. We open air. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction, and I'd also like to thank the organizers of this workshop for inviting me to give this um, presentation. So today I'm going to talk about some idealized experiments that I've been doing very recently with OpenIFS. Um, looking at the, how the structure and characteristics and statistics of extratropical cyclones will change in the future. And I'd like to thank um, Baivi Hapanala and Yoni Reisenen, my colleagues in the University of Helsinki, who've um, helped with this work. And I also would like to thank Glenn Carver for trying to answer my never-ending stream of questions about how to use OpenIFS, um, Helen Dacre and also Kevin Hodges for helping me with various bits of um, code and the technical aspects here. So I hope most of you know um, what extratropical cyclones are, but I thought it would be a good idea to show um, a quick example of what I'm really talking about. So when I talk about extratropical cyclones, I'm thinking about large-scale weather systems that are in the mid-latitudes. So this is an example of an infrared satellite image, um, taken from Monday evening, actually. Um, and overplotted is the surface pressure. So we can see um, this is a large, mature extratropical cyclone at the center here, trailing cold front and lots of cloud associated with it. We can also see there's an additional um, low pressure system um, also here. So this is the United Kingdom here, and we can see that there's um, another low pressure here. So both of these we can think of ex as an extratropical cyclone. 
But we can see that both of these systems look very different. So it's important to remember that not all extropical cyclones are equal. They have different characteristics, different strengths, for example. They have different amounts of precipitation associated with them, even in our current climate. However, extropical cyclones can lead to quite strong impacts that affect society. Um, three of these pictures are taken from my adopted country, Finland. So um, the top two are from Finland. So Often in winter, extropical cyclones can bring quite heavy snowfall. Um, this is in the centre of Helsinki. Um, you can see that obviously the transportation is having some um, challenges here. And also at the airport here, um, there you can see that in Helsinki we have um, very efficient snow clearing. Um, but we still need to do it. And also this costs a lot of money in Finland to deal with snow every year. You have to budget for how much your snow clearing is going to cost. The next picture here, so this is also in Finland, and um, this is another impact of extropical cyclones, which is m maybe more common to people, and it's wind. And this can cause um, damage to forests, for example, which is, um, affects the economy in Finland. Um, forestry is a major industry, and wood production is a major industry. The other three pictures I've taken from my um, native country, so the United Kingdom, and we can see the um, other impacts. For example, again, you have wind damage, um, falling trees, we also have flooding, so this is um, taken from a winter a few years ago in the UK when there was a stream of extropical cyclones, one after another, that affected the UK and brought lots of precipitation, which led to sustained flooding. And this is um, on the south coast of the UK where um, the, the main train line here um, to the southwest was basically swept away by damage related to um, extropical cyclones. So they can cause a large, lot of, large amount of disruption in our current climate, but the question I'm asking and thinking about is, well, how are these going to change in the future? Are they going to have more precipitation associated with them? Are they going to be stronger, so stronger winds? Um, but are there going to be fewer cyclones or more cyclones? So this is um, the overall motivation for this work. And we need predictions of these systems on different timescales. Um, for example, we need to think about individual weather events, so one individual storm. We need to be able to reliably predict this. There's also now um, the next step, which is the sub-seasonal prediction. So we need to try and understand, will the coming winter be more stormy um, than average or not? But we also need to think about these long-term um, changes. So this allows, for example, adaption and planning infrastructures, so coastal defences, for example, um, and also for development of power lines, for example, what do they have to withstand in the future? So it's this part here about understanding really long-term challenges, um, sorry, long-term changes, which I'm going to concentrate on today. So you might think, okay, well, how about you just go and look at some CMIP-5 models, so the current um, generation of our climate prediction models, and what do they show? Well, I think this has been touched on already today, and there's quite a large degree of uncertainty in how the storm tracks will change in the future if we look just at the climate models, but also if you look at storm tracks. So this plot here shows the change in um, extropical storm track density, um, basically between um, the future period and a historical period, for two different scenarios. So the RCP 4.5, which is a medium um, scenario, and then this much higher emissions scenario, RCP 8.5. And the shading shows the change in basically the number of extropical cyclones. So when it's blue, the models are predicting that there'll be an, a decrease in the number of storms. Where it's red, there'll be more storms. But the hatching here, so the stipling, these dots, these show the areas when at least 90% of the models at least agree on the sign of the change. Um, and you can see that there's, many, there's not many areas that are the stipled areas. So these are the areas where we actually have confidence in these predictions. So for example, the Mediterranean, a decrease in the number of cyclones in the low scenario and a more pronounced one in the higher scenario. But we can see that, for example, especially in the North Atlantic here, so affecting um, the UK, southern Sweden, into Finland here, there's very, there's, no, there's very little confidence in these future predictions. So therefore, although we can look at the, the CMIP-5 models and they do, we can learn a lot from them, it's very hard to understand the basic dynamics that are leading to these signals because there's so much variation between the different models and how the different models respond. So I think the, 
um, the overall aims which I've tried to introduce so far, that what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to, trying to quantify how will the number and track and intensity of the cyclones change in the future. And this is a topic that many people have addressed before. Many people look at this in climate models as well, for example. Um, and there's lots of studies on this first question. The second question which I'm trying to address is, to me, much more interesting in a sense. Um, and it's how will the structure of the extratropical cyclones change? Um, will they have, for example, um, different frontal structures? Will they have stronger warm conveyor belts, for example? Um, so this is um, what I hope to eventually manage to answer with um, open IFS. However, to answer the first one, I really think you need to have some understanding of the, sorry, to answer the second question, you have to have an understanding of the first one too. So, as I said, the CMIP-5 models are very complex. So, I'm going to the complete other end of the, the spectrum, and I'm taking a very idealized approach. I'm trying to simplify the problem. Um, as much as I can, but still retaining a realistic um, atmospheric um, setup. So I'm calling these um, simplified climate change experiments. Um, this is maybe a, a stretch of the term climate change experiment, but essentially in this work we're planning to do four experiments. So we have a control experiment, but we're also looking at um, the effect of increasing the sea surface temperatures in a uniform manner, so just warming them everywhere. And there's two other experiments um, looking at the effect of um, con um, CO2 concentrations and also both of these together. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had time to finish these results um, yet, so I'm only going to focus on the first one um, today. But if you're interested, um, I have some pre very preliminary results from this experiment. Um, so we're going to do this using an aquaplanet configuration. So as well as having a very simplified type of experiment, we have a very simplified model, so we have the, the open IFS configured into an aquaplanet configuration. And some more information about the model. So as I said, I'm doing this with open IFS. Um, so the aquaplanet I'm running has a resolution of um, T159 in the spectral resolution, so that's around about 125 kilometers, um, 62 vertical levels. There's no seasonal cycle in the model, so we have um, fixed solar radiation at, um, I think it's March, um, March equinox value, so the sun stays above the equator for the whole year. Um, the sea surface temperatures are constant in time, and we have a zonally uniform um, specification of the sea surface temperatures. And the way that we initialize the model is it's very simple. It's maybe a bit crude in a sense, but what we do is I just have taken a real atmospheric state. So I just picked some initial conditions I had already for open IFS. Um, and then I essentially removed the, um, changed the land sea mask. So set everywhere to sea underneath. I removed the topography and then I did some very basic interpolation of the fields from above the topography to the surface. And then I basically initialized the model Obviously, it's not in a very balanced state when I start because of this um, very crude initialization. So I need to run with quite a short time step to start with so the model can get into balance. But after about three months, um, the model has spun up into a very, um, into a realistic balanced state. And we've checked the spin up time by looking at the precipitation, for example. And I think even within two months, the model is very balanced. So the experiments I'm going to discuss today are um, changing the sea surface temperatures. So we have taken in our control simulation, which is this blue line here, we've taken what's called the QOBS um, sea surface temperature distribution from the um, Neil and Hoskins paper. And this is essentially a sinusoidal curve. So at the North Pole, sorry, South Pole, which is here, we basically set the temperature to be freezing, so 273 Kelvin also at the North Pole, and then we specify this function going up to around 300 Kelvin on the equator. In the experiment that I'm perturbing the sea surface temperatures, all I'm doing is a uniform warming of four degrees Kelvin. So this line just jumps up by four degrees everywhere. I run both of these experiments for 11 years. Um, I discard the whole of the first year just to be very safe to avoid any spin-up issues, although I'm fairly sure you could only discard the first three months and you'd be quite safe. Um, so after this, I have 10 years left for the analysis. And I, when I run the experiments, an uh, important thing I do is I output the 
um, the model state every six hours because I want to look at the extropical cyclones and I need to track them. So I need this high resolution output um, to, to do this. So here's a bit of an, an outline of what I'm going to present in terms of the results in the rest of the presentation. So first of all, we're just going to have a quick look at the zonal mean state of the control simulation and my SST plus four Kelvin <laughs> Simulation, hopefully to ensure you or to convince you that the model is doing something sensible and is producing a realistic state. We're then going to have a look at some of these, what I'm calling the bulk cyclone properties. So these are really um, statistical um, properties. For example, in um, looking at histograms of the intensity of the cyclones, for example. And I'm using an objective tracking algorithm that I'll discuss briefly to do this. And then finally, we'll look at the structure of cyclones by creating some composites of the strongest cyclones in my simulations. So here's the first results, and this is the zonal mean precipitation. So this is averaged over sort of year two to year 11. And the blue line here is the control simulation. Um, so we can see that we have a peak in the tropics of around 10 millimeters per day. We have a slight double ITCZ problem. Then we have the, the dry subtropics, and then we have the peak in the extratropics in both hemispheres. So we can see we've got around four millimeters per day um, in the extratropics, which is associated with the um, extratropical cyclones, the storm track. We can see that when we increase the sea surface temperatures, so remember they're increased uniformly, we don't change, change any gradients here. Um, so this is the orange line. So we see we really increase the tropical precipitation um, quite significantly. And we can also see that in the extratropics, in both hemispheres, we, um, we increase the precipitation slightly, but we also shift the peak polewards slightly. And this is consistent with the, the jet response. So now going on to look at those jet streams. Um, so this is now my control simulation. Um, so what we have here in the colors are the zonal mean, zonal wind. Um, so the cross section from going with the like, height and um, going from the South Pole to the North Pole. So we have the, the two jet streams up here, um, relatively strong, almost 50 meters per second. The black contours here are the temperature. So we see we have the warm part in the tropics, um, the baroclinic zones in the extratropics. And then we, we, have, um, we resolve the, the stratosphere somewhat. But we can see that we have relatively realistic looking um, zonal jets, which if you compared this to, for example, the climatological mean from era interim, you'd have reason of, it would be incomparable. One thing to note here is that the structure is symmetric, but I've said roughly, and that it's not a complete mirror opposite. Um, there are some subtle differences between the two hemispheres, very subtle ones in this experiment. In my CO2 experiment, which I'm not going to discuss today, there are more different, and um, there's more differences between the and different hemispheres, which may mean that a 10-year simulation is not quite enough to um, get rid of your natural variability. So then if we look at the response of the jets to the um, warming of sea surface temperatures, so the black lines here are from the control, so we have the, the maximums around um, 200 hectopascals. The shading here is the difference, so it's the experiment minus the control, so where it's red, the wind speeds have increased, and where it's blue, the wind speeds have decreased. And I've only plotted the values which are statistically significant here. Um, almost all of the changes here are actually statistically significant. And we can see, um, to start with, that there, there's more red than blue. So we seem to have stronger jets, but they also seem to move somewhat poleward and also upwards. And I think this is easier to see if we look at the same information, but in a slightly different way. So what I've plotted here is I've only looked at the northern hemisphere now. So we have 20 degrees to 80 degrees, and then the zonal mean wind speed at three different pressure levels. So where almost the maximum of the jet is, so 175 hectopascals, 250, and then much lower down, 850. And you can see actually the response of the jet is not a simple poleward shift in some ways. If we look, for example, at upper levels, the blue line is the control, the orange line is the warmed SSTs. And really what we see here, so the wind speeds increase at this level, but what's actually happened is the jet is moved up. And that's because the tropical, the tropopause is moving up because we've got more convection in the tropics 
So we have a um, we have deeper convection, and then the divergence into the extratropical um, atmosphere is occurring at a higher level. If we look at 250 hectopascals, we see a more um, complicated response. So actually, um, towards the equator, we see a, a decrease in the wind speed, whereas here we have a, a slight increase in the wind speed, which you could think of that as a poleward shift, but because the response is asymmetric, we've got more increase on the poleward side, the jet also appears to be broadening slightly. At low levels, so this is really what you can think of as the eddy-driven jet, so this is the part that the extratropical cyclones are really influencing. Here we see um, a very um, standard um, well, a much more typical, just poleward shift in the, the jet speed. And this relates um, very well to the precipitation plot that I showed you, where you saw the precipitation peak in the exotropics moving um, poleward. So, as I said, I track my exotropical cyclones using an objective measure. So this is Kevin Hodge's um, algorithm, originally named TRAC. So it basically aims to identify synoptic scale cyclones. I'm not interested in polar lows or mesoscale cyclones. I'm interested in the very large scale um, features. So this algorithm essentially looks for localized maximums in the 850 hectopascal relative vorticity field. Um, it's truncated to a coarse resolution because vorticity is a noisy field. We then do some filtering on the tracks. So to make sure I have large scale synoptic systems that are transient, so they're moving, so they're not stationary eddies, I need to ensure that they move at least 1,000 kilometers and they, it lasts for at least two days. So they have to be relatively long lasting systems. I also exclude some cyclones which do not have at least one point north of 30 degrees north. Um, the tracking algorithm actually picks up quite a lot of tropical cyclones, which are generally very weak, and they generally stay around in the tropics and don't do very much. But they can, there's quite a few of them, and they have very weak um, relative vorticities. So I remove all of them. And then the output of track is essentially the, um, you get the maximum vorticity, but you also get the position of the, the, each individual cyclone every six hours. And from this, you can obviously calculate statistics such as the genesis latitude, lysis latitude, etc. So some results from the, the tracking algorithm. So what I have plotted here, so we have a histogram, a um, normalized histogram of the maximum vorticity. Um, so this is times 10 to the negative 5 seconds to minus 1. And this is um, the orange colors are the control, and then the blue is the experiment with the warmed SSTs. So you can see in this distribution that there's, they're relatively similar in a sense. And if we look at the mean and the median values of the maximum vorticity, they're actually very similar in both um, simulations. If we look at the standard deviation, we can see that if we increase the SSCs, we have a slight increase. So the, the distribution is broadening. But also if we think about the, like the extreme cyclones, so if we look to the tail here, we see the, the blue parts are poking up above the, the, the orange part. So this means that in the SST plus four distribution um, simulation, we've got, probably, we've got more extreme cyclones in a sense. And we see this, so if you look at the maximum ones, this is the strongest cyclone, and um, the strongest cyclone is quite a bit stronger. And also I've written here, so this 200 threshold. So this means when I create the composites, I'm looking at my 200 strongest storms. So I want to see the, this is the, the vorticity value which the, the 200th storm has in the data set. And again, this increases slightly. So when we warm the SSTs, it appears that the, the mean and the median intensity of cyclones does not change, but maybe there are some more extreme cyclones. And we can also think about the number of cyclones, so that's the top line here, and we can see that warming the SSTs leads to a small reduction in the number of cyclones. And this, this obviously makes sense if we have um, if you decrease the number of cyclones, each cyclone probably has to do more work, so you have to have slightly stronger cyclones. So this is again the same type of plot, but looking at the genesis and lysis latitudes, so genesis on the um, left, lysis on the right. And again, we see what we saw in terms of when we looked at the jet shift and the precipitation shift, that the genesis region is moving poleward, so again we have the blue parts here. And also the lysis region is um, moving polewards in both of these cases. 
And the typical shift, so down here, so the negative sign indicates a poleward shift in terms of degrees of latitude. So they're moving between around 1.5 and um, 2 degrees towards the pole. Interestingly, the lysis regions are moving less polewards than the genesis regions. So in a sense, on the average, the cyclones are not traveling as meridionally. Okay, so now we're getting on to look at the composites of cyclones, so the structure of cyclones. And I'm using a method which um, Jennifer Cattle used as part of her PhD, and it's published in this paper in Journal of Climate. So there's three steps to this process. So the first one is we track our cyclones. So this is this step here. So we, we use track to find the track of each individual cyclone. And then I select the tracks I want to use. So I filter them to only pick 200 tracks. So I want the 200 strongest storms. And then for each track, I find the position of the maximum intensity along the track. And I call this time equals zero, so t equals zero. So this is essentially equal to each of these black dots here. So there's three different cyclones here, and we find the maximum intensity. And what we do when we find the maximum intensity, we then combine the output from track with the output from open IFS. So what I do is I take the output from open IFS in a circle, so this is a spherical cap, so it has a spherical grid. So I overlay this on my cyclone center, and then I interpolate from the open IFS output grid to the spherical cap, which is normalized, so centered on the position of the cyclone. I do this for lots of different offset times. So here, this would be time equals zero, but I also look at time equals minus 24 hours, minus 48 hours, and then on the other side, I'd look at time plus 24 and plus 48 hours. And then we have, we do this for each cyclone, and once we've done that, we need to add them all together to take an average. There's one last complication. We need to rotate all of our cyclones so that they're traveling in the same direction, because obviously, if we just average these on a north-south grid, if this one is traveling this way and this one is traveling that way, the same features in terms of cold fronts and warm fronts are not going to be in the same place. So we need to rotate them, which is shown here, so they all travel directly east. And then all we do is we take an average of the 200 storms to get our resulting composite cyclone. And we get the composite for each different offset time. So when we do this, this is the results. So this is the, the composite for the mean sea level pressure. The top line is showing the control simulation and the bottom one the um, warmed SSTs. So time equals zero is the time of maximum intensity. This is 24 hours before the time of maximum intensity and then 24 hours after. So if we just focus on the top line just now, we can see that we have a um, very strong low pressure system here. It's around 960, I think. Um, I guess it's hard to see the numbers. 962 is the minimum pressure, about 950 at the maximum intensity, and then it starts to fill um, later on. And we can see it looks like a relatively sensible um, cyclonic structure. So at the bottom, this is the um, second experiment, but I think it's more intuitive to look at a difference plot. So now this is the, the difference. So the blue parts here, this shows that the, the pressure is lower in the warm sea surface temperature. So at all offset times, the pressure is lower to the north and slightly higher to the south. And also the pressure in the, the center of the cyclone here is actually um, slightly higher at the early part, at, the, at all of these times. But the pressure gradient across the cyclone is essentially increasing when we warm the sea surface temperatures. We can look at the same types of figures now for the total column water vapor. Um, so here, the, the blue colors are the moist um, parts. So here you see the warm conveyor belt developing. At time equals zero, you see it wrapping up cyclonically into the center of the cyclone. You see this drier air being pulled down back behind the cold front. And then later on, you see that the, the, overall the, the cyclone is drier later on, and this is usually because it's moved further north. Um, but you see again that there's drier air to the north and moister air to the south. You can see very clearly in the um, SST plus 4 that almost everywhere um, the moisture increases. And this is not surprising when we increase the, the sea surface temperatures. The water by the clausius clapeyron equation, there's going to be more moisture in the atmosphere. The total column water vapor is going to increase. 
But we can maybe see that there are some um, slight structural differences. For example, if we compare the time equals zero, this one maybe is more cyclonically wrapped up in a sense than at this point here. Um, so maybe there are some subtle structural differences here. Again, this is the difference plot on the bottom now. And again, you see, so most of the, the strong differences occur earlier on. I should say this is maybe a misleading color bar. The, the smallest value here is actually zero. So there is moisture increasing everywhere. Um, but you see there is a very large increase here. It's almost um, 10 kilograms per meter squared. So it's a large increase here. Um, but then also you see that later on, especially at the time of maximum intensity, there's not um, a, not a uniform, the, the spatial pattern is not uniform in the increase. There's um, this part here which increases less, for example, which is really in the, in the warm sector part of the cyclone here. So then if we go on to look at the precipitation, um, so you can see that um, if we just look at the top line here, we see that most of the precipitation actually occurs before the time of maximum intensity. This is an agreement with previous studies. Um, these precipitation values are around two millimeters per day, so they're relatively sensible. And you see it really maps out this typical warm conveyor belt area of a cyclone. But you can also see there's some, um, so you see that there's, um, if we compare this one here, and also then in the sea surface temperature, you can see the position of the maximum is shifted. So here it seems it's um, moved slightly further um, north in a sense than in the control simulation. And this is more evident if we look in the, the difference plots. So here when the, the, these blue colors show an increase in precipitation, these brown colors show a decrease in precipitation. Um, so you can see that there's, that the area of the precipitation is shifting and it's moving more sort of to almost like a head of the, the warm front. You could almost think that the precipitation associated with the cold front is decreasing, but the precipitation is associated with the warm front is potentially increasing. Um, so this maybe suggests that there's some change in the structure of the, the fronts in the cyclones. This is then moving on. So related to the vertical, the precipitation is obviously the, the vertical motion. And I've only looked at this at 700 hectopascals. And I have to say this is omega, so in units of pascals per second. So the, the blue colors here, which are negative, are ascent. And the red colors are descent. And this matches um, relatively well with the precipitation patterns, um, particularly if we compare um, the time equals zero. So if you look at the difference plots for the vertical motion, again, so here this is red, so it's less ascending motion. And here there's more ascending motion. And this matches up very well with what we saw in the um, precipitation pattern. So these are very new results, I have to say. I'm not sure I fully understand them. Um, but I've been having a, a think and a bit of a hypothesize about what might happen with the structure of cyclones in the future climate. And this is a paper um, from Barnes and Hartman, 2012. And they were essentially looking in, um, this is CMIP-3 models actually, so two different um, scenarios. So one is um, a sort of a climate change simulation and one is a control. And they were looking at how wave breaking changes. So you can have anti-cyclonic wave breaking or cyclonic wave breaking. And this, in a sense, can affect the structure of the cyclones you have. Um, so in their um, analysis, they found that cyclonic wave breaking decreases in their climate change experiment, where anti-cyclonic wave breaking increases in the, um, in the future in their climate change experiment. So this is one thing that I hope to look at in the future. So one question I could ask are, are the cyclones in my SST my warmed SST experiment, are they more anti-cyclonic than, um, than in the control simulation? And I think the, way, the best way to address this is to look at some composites of um, isentropic potential vorticity, I think. So this is um, hopefully what we plan to do next, to try and understand these, if there are any structural changes in these cyclones. So some um, preliminary conclusions, in a sense. So when we increase the sea surface temperatures in our aquaplanet configuration, um, the number of cyclones decreases slightly, but the mean intensity does not change. Um, there are maybe, there, there's more extreme cyclones, so ones with very high um, maximum vorticities. And also the genesis and lysis regions move poleward, as do the zonal jets. 
Um, there are some subtle changes to the cyclone structure, which um, I don't fully understand yet. The ascent and the precipitation definitely seem to change, and maybe there's some indications of a different type of um, cyclonic or anti-cyclonic wrap-up. Um, I have to say these are um, very new results, so hopefully there's more to come soon, but I would like to stop now, and thank you for your attention and ask, uh, answer any questions.